Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us again. In this segment, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Carlos Doty, joining us to talk about the results from two trials presented at the virtual edition of the uh, European Hematology Association's Annual Congress. Welcome to the program, Dr. Doty. Thank you for taking the time this morning. Hi, Neil. Thank you very much for having me. Now, I understand that you have a role with AstraZeneca. Tell me about your role with AstraZeneca. Give us a little bit of your background and just a bit about the team that you work with. Sure. So, as you mentioned, my name is Carlos Dotti. I was born in Argentina. I'm a hematologist by training. I worked both in Argentina and the U.S. as a hematologist for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And since the last five years, I've been working in AstraZeneca, Basically, I joined the company in 2016 to help get into this new world for our company of hematology, trying to bring new medicines closest to people that need it the most. Uh, I'm currently, my role is the global head of medical affairs for the hematology franchise. I work uh, closely with U.S., European, and international markets to help them um, get into this new world for AstraZeneca while supporting healthcare professional patient organizations. Uh, we're mostly dedicated for now in, with our new compound with acalabrutinib. The commercial name is Talquins, was approved um, mm-hmm. last year for chronic lymphocytic leukemia in the U.S. And we're seeking approval in other international and European markets this year and the following my now, team is six people in the U.S., but mm-hmm. we have 77 launches awaiting for us in the next 18 months. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a pretty big team that we work with, either directly or, not, or indirectly. You mentioned Calquins, um for patients with, you say, chronic uh, lymphocytic uh, leukemia, correct? Correct. Now, and this is also known as CLL. What is CLL and who is typically affected by it? So CLL is a condition that starts with the lymphocytes in the bone marrow. It's an, it's an increase in, in, in the production of these cells that currently we don't have a cure. So it progresses initially as an indolent disease. It typically starts around the age of 67 to 70. Mm-hmm. So in, in, on your last, uh, in, in your seventh decade of life, usually it starts as an indolent disease. You can only pick it up by an exam well, because the lymphocyte starts growing while not affecting the other cells in the bone marrow. Mm-hmm. At some point, you can either get symptoms because you either displace the other normal cells in the bone marrow, causing anemia or bleeding or infections, or because the lymphocytes now grow outside the marrow and into the lymph nodes and you typically can find some small lymph nodes in the head or in the neck and in the armpits. But most frequently, it's, it's picked up on a routine exam test. Mm-hmm. Uh, so once you're, the di- you're diagnosed of, of this CLL, because it's an indolent disease, as I mentioned first, from most of the times, you don't need immediate treatment. So you just need to follow up the patients, whether it will be needing treatment afterwards. Roughly around 50% of the patients do not require treatment at the beginning of the disease, but eventually within months or years after that, most of them will require some form of intervention to either control the lymphocyte growth or control the symptoms associated with those lymphocytes growth. Is this something that is misdiagnosed frequently? Can it mask itself as, as other conditions that also need to simply be monitored when in fact this is something that is needs to be monitored until just a couple of months or as you say, maybe a year down the road when treatment is going to be necessary? Well, you know, it always depends on how knowledgeable the physician that sees you is. If you have an initial black count of 100,000, with an exaggeration, but just to make my point, uh, nobody will not defer you to a hematology because that's 10 times more than your usual uh, black counts. If you, but you can start it with 12,000, 15,000, and that can be missed because you think, well, maybe this is a viral infection, mm-hmm. maybe this is something also indolent, and it can present like that, and then you defer it. But Eventually, those lymphocytes the lymphocytes will, will continue growing and you will be deferred to a hematologist. Mm-hmm. Now, once you reach to a hematologist, the, diagnolo- the diagnosis is pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. 
it only takes a drop of blood under the microscope to realize how um, these lymphocytes are, and then the workup is, is pretty simple. Now, what was the data that was shared at the uh, EHA for Calquins? Um, what is it, and how does it actually work for the patient? Sure. So we got our first approval in the U.S. in 2017 uh, for mantle cell lymphoma, and that was followed by the publication of our data in CLL in two trials, Elevate TN and Ascend. Elevate TN is first-line treatment of CLL, and ASCEND was a second-line treatment trial. Those trials grant us the FDA approval at the end of last year. This year at EHA, what we presented is the follow-up results of ASCEND, our second-line trial, and a four, almost five years follow-up of one of our initial trials, which was called ZL001, which is um, first-line treatment-naive, patients with, treated with a calabrutinib long-term, so 4.4 years of follow-up. Mm-hmm. Why is this relevant? The CL001 brings more uh, information or something that is very important for patients because what we got from our initial approval trial, as I mentioned before, it was called Elevate TN, is the efficacy results and uh, the, the first initial results on safety. So our efficacy results are unprecedented. We have 90% progression for survival results. That is, Mm -hmm. 90% of the patients remain on treatment without progressing with the combination of Talcum plus an anti-CD20 antibody and 80% on the single therapy arm. Now, that is great results. Efficacy is always the center of what we try to accomplish with with any any drug, specifically in the oncology setting. Mm -hmm. However, an additional important factor on this is that this is not just an oncological disease. We need to put more emphasis into the chronicity of this. That's the chronic lymphocytic leukemia, emphasis on chronic. Because patients will be on that first-line therapy for many years, so usually between five or seven years. So getting the efficacy is of crucial importance, but mm-hmm. definitely getting that efficacy with quality of life, with safety, it's very, very important. Imagine if you have, if you're a patient on your 70, you have comorbidities. You're taking two, three, four medication for high blood pressure, for cholesterol, for the common things that affect people at that age group. Mm-hmm. And I put you on a drug, which will uh, be very effective for your for your condition, but it's more adverse event. It mm-hmm. makes your life more complex. So our four-year results for the, with the CLL001 proved that the long-term follow-up of these patients is as good as our initial results from Elevate TM, meaning less adverse events that occur in treatment, with most of those adverse events occurring at the beginning of the treatment. And specifically, this class, which is called Brooklyn tyrosine kinase inhibitors, have some specific adverse events in the cardiovascular area. One of them, which is of concern of the physician, is atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular rhythm of the heart. Uh, the first drug in this setting causes around 10 to 15 page, uh, percent of atrial fibrillation for patients with CLL. Our results show around 4 percent of atrial fibrillation. So that is a huge increase. Specifically, as I mentioned before, this age group is the one that suffers most of these conditions. So that is the relevance of 001. When going to the second line, the ASCEND, the other trial that I mentioned before, it's also a long-term follow-up. It's two years of follow-up, but it's also the first time that a novel treatment like Calcoins is compared with another novel treatment. In this case, particularly, it's called Idelacilid, which is a drug that's been out for a couple of years now. And at two years of follow-up, the progression-free survival for Calcoins was 82 percent. That means 82 percent of the patients did not progress. We was almost double from the competitor arms, which includes idelacilib and chemotherapy with pentamustine. So definitely, these are good results in terms of efficacy. And once again, no new signals of adverse events, low rate of adverse events, and the adverse events that did occur occur at the beginning of the treatment. 
give our listeners a website where we can get some more information about CalQuince and about some of the uh, information that we've been talking about this segment. Yes, so there is the AstraZeneca corporate website that we can give you, and we can give you the link afterwards. There's a section for patients, there's a section for physicians, and there's also some information for U.S. patients. Specifically, as you know, the access to oncological drugs is different in the U.S. than in the rest of the world, so there are some helping tools for, for patients also. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Duddy, for joining us here on Health Professional Radio this morning. Thank you very much for having me. This is a very important time for us in AstraZeneca. We've entered with Calquins in this new era for our company into hematology. And this is our first big step, but not the last step. We're working on a very big portfolio that will address the patient's need, not only in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, but also in other diseases with a high unmet need like acute myeloid leukemia, myelodysplastic syndromes, multiple myeloma, and other forms of high aggressive lymphoma. So thank you very much for this opportunity. We're looking forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.